Okay, so we can get start, get started. Hello. Hey, so hi everybody. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, with uh, uh, Scott and I, we're going to tell you about uh, building cloud native applications uh, with containers, uh, functions, and managed services. Uh, so, first, a little bit about ourselves, Scott. Yeah, so I'm Scott Colton. I'm based out of Sydney, Australia. I work in the developer advocacy team. Uh, for Microsoft and specialize in Kubernetes and container runtimes and all those sorts of things. Um, been in the, Docker, in the Docker Captain's project for about four years, so probably Phil was the only one that was older than me and unfortunately bought Red Hat, so he got kicked out. Uh, so now I'm at like an OG, uh, um, uh, an OG sort of Docker Captain. And next is Patrick. You know Phil cannot joke about that. Oh, no. Uh, so, <laughs> so hi, everybody. I'm Patrick Chanazon. Uh, uh, I work with Scott in the cloud advocacy team at Microsoft. And before that, I spent uh, four years at Docker uh, uh, with, uh, <laughs> with Tony that, uh, that talked just before about BuildKit. So BuildKit container D, I'm a big fan here still. Uh, and, um, and, and so my focus is on uh, containers on Azure. So today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, one big topic, which is uh, over the past few years, uh, people have been using Docker and then Kubernetes to build these cloud native applications. But nowadays, uh, more and more, uh, these applications become more complex. And uh, typically, you're building an application with uh, three components, uh, containers, uh, serverless functions that respond to events uh, and uh, manage uh, cloud services. So in this talk, uh, uh, we're going to try to uh, uh, cover the developer experience for that. Uh, how do you package your application when it contains all these components and how do you make it scale? Uh, one of the things I wanted to say is uh, uh, one of the reasons why I was super happy to join Microsoft uh, is that Microsoft's mission is around productivity uh, so it's about uh, uh, empowering every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And it started with uh, 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 Bill Gates uh, creating Visual Basic. So it started in developer tools. And so Microsoft always had uh, a, a strong story around uh, trying to make developers more productive. And I think with the history of cloud native applications over the past five years, now we're getting to a stage where it's really important to start to take a look at how we can make developers uh, more, um, uh, more productive. So these three abstractions that I talked about, containers, functions triggered by event and managed cloud services, uh, over the past three years, there's been a lot of uh, portable serverless platforms uh, that emerge on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so you have uh, things like uh, the FN project by Oracle, uh, which, uh, which characteristic is that it has a nice way of composing functions. Nucleo, which is a, a super uh, a high performance uh, and, and, and more suited for intensive data processing. Uh, OpenFast, which is like the Swiss army knife of, uh, uh, of um, uh, serverless platforms. Uh, uh, it can do a lot of things, and it's super easy to use and get started. Galactic Fog and OpenWhisk. Uh, more recently, there's been two projects that are more like middleware on top of which you can build a, a function experience, uh, uh, which are Knative and Keda. So we'll talk a little bit about Keda here. Uh, and the, the CNCF has a serverless working group. Uh, so these diagrams that show what a portable serverless uh, offering is are, are coming from their white paper that I highly recommend if, you, if you're new to that, this space. Uh, on the Azure side, uh, we have our own uh, first party service uh, that's called Azure Functions that we manage at Microsoft. But all the runtime for it is open source. So uh, you can run Azure Functions uh, in containers in your own Kubernetes cluster if you want. It's all on GitHub. Uh, and uh, so that's, um, so I'm going to talk about the dev experience. And I, I nuked my slides here, uh, but I'm going to talk through it. <laughs> it's been the third time, uh, uh, the third time we, we mess it up. Uh, the dev experience I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, is called the Azure Dev Spaces. And it's, uh, it's uh, a service that we operate in Azure and that lets you as a developer, and it's tied with a, um, it's tied with a Visual Studio Code extension, so that you as a developer, when you're building an application, 
you don't need to know anything about Kubernetes. Uh, you don't need to have the runtime of the language that you're developing in installed on your machine. You just need to have your source code and VS code. So I'll show you uh, what it looks like. And the goal of uh, uh, Azure Dev Spaces is to, have, uh, to make it easier for developers to collaborate together uh, when, they have, uh, when they're using common services, managed cloud services, uh, for their application. So the way the experience works is that you have a VS Code plugin, and there's a command line as well called EasyDS. Uh, and that VS Code plugin uh, interacts with a, a, a server-side uh, um, controller that you install in a namespace in your Kubernetes cluster. And so once the connection between the two is established, uh, the VS Code extension is able uh, to prime your project. It looks at your project and it recognizes, oh, this is a Node.js project. I'm going to create a Docker file for it. I'm going to create a hand chart for it. And I'm going to connect to the, um, uh, the uh, uh, server-side controller uh, that's, that sits in your Kubernetes cluster. I'm going to pass all the code to it. And on the server-side, we're going to do a Docker build. And actually, I wonder if they're using the new build kit functionality or not. I, I should talk to the team about that, because there, there's lots of uh, options there. Uh, and then it's uh, deploying it with the hand chart. Uh, and then it opens uh, a connection for debugging. So you're in VS Code. Uh, you initialize your project, and then you can start debugging in the cloud right away. And your code can leverage uh, a, a series of services that, that are already uh, set up in Azure. Uh, and there's an ingress controller in there also that can create URLs. Uh, yeah, in addition to that, there's, uh, you, it can create URLs that are public so that your colleagues can test your code uh, uh, in a public way, or it can create a tunnel between you and the, between your laptop and the, uh, and the, the code in, uh, in the cloud. So, so let, me, uh, let me show you what it looks like. Uh, so I'm here in... Uh, uh, I'm here in there. Uh, let me first, so here, uh, in order to uh, play with Kubernetes, I always use Docker Desktop. Uh, so I have my local Kubernetes cluster, which is still starting. And then here in Docker Desktop, I can switch context. And uh, here, I'm going to use a PAT AKS cluster, which is a, a, a cluster in uh, Azure uh, that's managed by uh, AKS uh, that I have created. And so I, I check that my context is right. I'm just going to clear that out. Uh, and so I'm just going to do a kubectl get nodes to show you that this is not the one on my laptop. Uh, it's uh, the one in AKS that I'm connected to. Uh, I opened it. Uh, I created it 65 days ago. I hope I won't have any problem with accounting because <laughs> I should delete my cluster more often. Uh, so then uh, I do a kubectl um, uh, get namespaces. Uh, and you will see that I have installed uh, uh, Azure Dev Spaces in my cluster. So there's one instruction with the Azure command line to do that. Once I've done that, it creates this AZDS uh, namespace. And when I do uh, kubectl uh, get all, uh, dash n uh, azds. So when I look at what's inside of that uh, um, namespace, uh, you'll see I have um, uh, I have a daemon set to pre-pull all the images uh, that I'm going to use, and I have some services for the controller, a service for the controller, uh, tiller that that is used for uh, for Helm, uh, and then traffic that's used for as an ingress uh, ingre ingress controller. Uh, so once I've done that, uh, I can start working on my project. So I'm just going to do a, a code in uh, AZDS uh, Node Web Frontend. So that's a simple, that's a very simple uh, Node.js application just to show you what the experience looks like as a developer. Uh, and so in there, I don't have much. I just have a like a, a, a node uh, uh, project, a package.json, and uh, some CSS and JavaScript, so it's, uh, it, and, and an index.html page. So pretty simple 
application, I don't have much, and I'm a web developer, I don't know anything about Kubernetes, uh, but I want to start, may maybe my application is using some cloud services that I have set up. And so here what I'm doing is that uh, I'm going to go in the command palette and I'm going to use the uh, extension Azure Dev Spaces prepare configuration uh, files for Azure Dev Spaces. When I click there, it asks me whether I want to have a public endpoint for my application. So in this case, I'm going to click yes. Uh, but if it's a really secret application, I could say no. And you can see what's happening there is that here I have a Docker file that appears. No, I haven't installed the extension yet. So I have a Docker file that appears, uh, some configuration uh, for Azure Dev Spaces that I could modify, and then a Helm chart. And in VS Code, I have a launch configuration, which means that I can start uh, debugging my application right away with that launch configuration. So I don't need to set up anything. And if I go in uh, uh, debug mode there, you can see I, I have a launch server on AZDS. And if I click there, uh, you can see it's launching something. It's executing AZDS up with uh, some port mapping. And what this uh, AZDS up uh, command line is going to do is it's going to connect to Azure, to, the, uh, to my AKS cluster, to the controller, AZDS controller on the other side, and it's going to push the code over there or sync my changes in my code, uh, do a Docker build, uh, and this is where there could be some uh, interesting optimization with BuildKit, uh, and then do a Helm uh, deploy of the whole application, uh, and then uh, 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 creates a tunnel uh, between my local machine uh, and the remote endpoint so that I can start debugging right away. Uh, and actually, if I go, okay, so so I think this is ready. And if I go, uh, if I go in the in the files, if I go in server, uh, server.js in there, uh, I can put a, put a breakpoint in there, uh, and. When I go in my terminal, it tells me that it's available at a public endpoint. Uh, so if I go at that public endpoint, uh, I can give that to some of my colleagues. And here, I'm hitting uh, uh, the Azure, um, uh, the Azure uh, um, uh, load balancer that goes inside of my Kubernetes cluster via the ingress controller to that URL. And inside of it, uh, I end up into my application in debug mode. And so here, uh, I can... Uh, if I go in the debug view, I can see all my local variables, uh, and I could modify uh, this, for example. I could say, oh, no, actually, I, I need to modify it there. So I should have created a variable. But basically, I can start debugging my app there. Uh, and when I say continue, uh, it's uh, saying hello from web frontend over there. Uh, so, so that's uh, debugging uh, with AZDS. Uh, the, uh, the other experience I wanted to show you, so EZDS, in addition to that, uh, has, um, uh, has a few, uh, oh, sorry. In addition to that, has a few interesting features where uh, w with the, um, uh, the, the URL that it creates for you, you can create different branches uh, so that uh, uh, developers, one developer can have their own version of a certain part of a multi-service app uh, uh, running at a certain URL, while the rest of the developers in the team uh, uh, can use the same other set of services. So it's really for teams to collaborate uh, together on applications that use lots of services uh, in common. Now, there's uh, another uh, uh, developer experience that's uh, really cool that I wanted to show you. Uh, which is called uh, uh, Live Share. Uh, so VS Code Live Share uh, lets you uh, collaborate with someone who has VS Code on their machine. Uh, and you can, here, I, I'm able to give access to the code on my machine, uh, a terminal, and a host uh, on my machine uh, to Scott here, who has nothing from this application, without having him to install anything. And the beauty of it is that LiveShare works really well with AZDS, uh, with Azure Dev Spaces, which means that he'll be able from his machine to uh, debug uh, the application that we saw uh, in my Kubernetes cluster without having access to it, uh, just through uh, LiveShare. 
So uh, we're at 45. Maybe I'll just skip that demo, because I, I, I think it's pretty long. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add to the slide um, uh, a link, because I gave that demo at DockerCon. Uh, and so you, you, you can watch that, that demo there. Because it, it takes at least five minutes, and we have uh, uh, just 20 minutes more. And, and there's more stuff I wanted to show you. Uh, but just, just to know that both are working together. And then the third experience I wanted to show you is uh, VS Code Remote extension for containers. So that's something that came out uh, very recently. It's an open source extension uh, uh, for VS Code. Uh, and what it's doing is that um, uh, it lets you uh, create some configuration uh, in v uh, for your VS Code project so that uh, VS Code is split into two parts. Uh, the local part uh, that has the themes and the UI and all the extensions. And then it, it can run uh, uh, the server part of VS Code with its own set of extensions inside of a Docker container. Which means that, uh, and so you can use that with your local Docker engine. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, in your GitHub project, if you set up uh, uh, that, that VS Code configuration uh, with a Docker file for your project, every developer who's going to join their, your team when they're doing a, a, a Git checkout uh, or a Git clone of the project, uh, they can launch uh, in debug mode in, in VS Code right away. Uh, and all of them will have a similar experience. They don't need to have any runtime installed on their machine. They use Docker. And their code is mounted inside of, uh, uh, inside of the Docker container. Uh, and so you can customize uh, all these uh, containers. And I'm just going to show you uh, uh, what that looks like. So that, um, uh, that VS Code uh, remote extension, that's something that, uh, uh, that was announced, uh, um, I think, uh, a month and a half ago. So it's six weeks, uh, six weeks old. Uh, it came out in the regular version of VS Code uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and in addition to Docker, it can do also uh, SSH uh, and, and WSL if you're on Windows. Uh, so let me uh, close this up. And I'm going to say here, so I'm in VS Code, and I, I go in the command palette, and I say um, remote container, open folder in container. Uh, so it's going to show me uh, all my folders. And so I have some examples of uh, a container-enabled projects in there. I'm going to take one where I have done the build already, so the JavaScript node 8. Uh, so when I open this one, you can see it's installing the dev container. And let's take a look at what it's doing behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, it's taking the Docker file uh, that I have in my project. It's building a Docker image with it. Uh, and then it's doing a Docker run uh, with that code base inside of that Docker image. And in that Docker image, there's a, a VS Code server that's running. Uh, so that, and, and, and plus, it creates a, a launch.json uh, with a debug configuration for uh, uh, for that project, which means I can say I want to launch uh, that program, and it's going to like uh, launch my. This is a Node application again, uh, and then I can ask for uh, a new terminal uh, in there, and the new terminal is going to be um, inside of the container. So here you can see I have VS Code Server running uh, and my Node process. Uh, and if I do a curl of a uh, local host uh, on port 3000, uh, so I'm, I, I hit the breakpoint that I had in there inside of my code. So here I'm debugging uh, a Node.js application inside of a container, and I didn't have anything to do to set up uh, all that uh, logistics. Uh, so I'm just going to say yeah, continue, and yeah, so that just works. So that's. Um, that's a remote extension. Uh, in terms of uh, development, there's just one more. Uh, so th these were the two, uh, uh, the two experiences I wanted to show you. Uh, let me go to, uh, to, the right, um, to the right slide. 
Yeah. In addition to that, uh, when you want to debug uh, either functions or containers uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, there are a bunch of other projects you can take a look at. Uh, uh, Squash is one uh, from the Glue team. Uh, there's Telepresence, which is a, um, a CNCF project. There's Ksync uh, and Tilt, which is pretty recent. Uh, I have, a, if you're looking for my slides for DockerCon, I have a, a bunch of explanation about how to use all of them. Uh, so that covers the developer experience. Uh, now Scott is going to talk about uh, application packages, uh, packaging. How do you package all these applications that have containers, uh, functions, as well as uh, um, uh, managed cloud services? All right. Oh, yeah, sorry. Can you hear that? Oh, yep. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. All right. So Patrick's done a really good job of showing the application developer persona. But me, myself, uh, I'm not really much of an application developer. I'm more of an ops, opsy types person. Um, so I'm going to show you CNAB, which is an open specification from both Microsoft and Docker. And also, I believe HashiCorp and Bitnami uh, are now um, working with it. And what it actually does is it's an abstraction over tools that you already have. Um, so these tools could be Helm, these tools could be um, Ansible, these tools could be Popper, it could be anything. And basically what it does is gives you a framework to be able to deploy these applications and code that you already have in an abstracted way. Um, this allows you to have your deployment pipelines really, really slimmed down. So instead of having multiple binaries and multiple things like that, you can have just a single way to deploy things. The best thing about CNAB is the invocation image is a container, so you don't need any binaries. Um, you just download the invocation image, and away you go. Microsoft has um, a, a, has a uh, implementation of CNAB called Porter. Um, what this actually gives you and why you would want to use Porter is we have built things called Mixins. And what Mixins are is the smarts to talk to a cloud native API. So if you want to deploy to Kubernetes, you don't need to know anything about Kubernetes except the deployment mechanism that you want. The Mixin will look after the smarts for um, talking to the Kubernetes API for you. Same with Azure, same with Terraform, um, and also Helm. So if you've already got Helm charts and you want to deploy them and pass uh, different variables through different YAMLs because you can do that with Porter, um, then that's, you don't need to know anything about Helm. There's a Helm mix in there for you. So basically, you just put the variables that you want into, into the code, and away you go. So it's actually really, really simple. And the good thing about CNAB, whether you use our implementation or you use Docker apps, which is Docker's implementation, um, it's not trying to replace any tools that you've got. It's actually working with the tools you've got. And if you build a CNAB correctly, you should be able to use Docker app or Porter. Um, they should be totally interchangeable. The other good thing about CNAB bundles is there's work going on in the OCI at the moment to allow bundles to be pushed to the OCI registry. So what this means is you can actually push your CNAB bundles up with your images, and the um, application scaffolding will live with the container image, which is really cool. Now, Patrick's application, um, although it looks like a really simple Node application, it actually has lots and lots of load on it. So he, he, and he wants performance, performance, performance. Uh, and if I don't give him that, then when we do our manager's review, I'll uh, get in trouble. No, no, that's not a joke. Uh, Australian humor, though. Um, but basically, what we've found in, with Kubernetes in general, and this is cloud in general, um, provisioning a VM is slow. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're in Azure um, or in Alibaba Cloud or any other of the clouds. If you go to um, a node autoscaler, you're gonna, it's going to be like two minutes before the Kubernetes node is ready, at least, if not more. Um, so a project was started inside Microsoft and now is in CNCF called Virtual Kubelet. And what that allows you to do is interface to a container runtime and make it look like it's a node that's in the cloud. So if you're on Azure, that will be um, ACI. If you're on Alibaba Cloud, I believe it's EBI. Um, but there's, there's lots out there. If you're on AWS, it would be Fargate. 
So what this allows you to do is actually scale your pods across vertically without having to wait for a node to spin up. So it'll hit the ACI API and it will spin up a pod straight away for you. Um, and when you're doing a high, highly transactional sort of workload, this can save you time and also could save you money. Um, Virtual Kubelet doesn't give you a full, full, um, a full node, but it does give you enough that you can get away with a whole, whole, a whole heap of stuff. So you can see all the different stuff there. So you get all the normal get pod stuff. Um, and Virtual Kubelet, the open source implementation, there is some limitations to networking coming back into the cluster and bits and pieces like that. If you use the, the implementation in, on Azure, we call it Virtual Node, and we'll set up the CNI provider, and we'll set up a whole heap of networking to speak back to your cluster. So if there's any resources in your cluster that you need to speak back to, you'll be able to do that. Alibaba Cloud has taken it one step further, and they've got a project called Viking, which looks after DNS resolution across their, um, their cloud. So at the moment, we do IP across on the CNI. They do DNS. Uh, and they also were able to run service mesh across virtual node, um, which is amazing. Like that, that was the first time I saw that was in Barcelona. But we need something to look after the scaling. And this is where Keta comes in. Um, so when, when a HTTP request comes in through Kubernetes, what we want to do is actually scale it. Um, and we want to scale it to virtual node, but we need something to look after that and look at the metrics coming into the cluster and then scale it across to the appropriate place, with, which is virtual node for us or virtual kubelet. Um, so Keto looks after that. So Keto can work with a whole heap of um, technologies to look at metrics. So it can look at RabbitMQ, Prometheus. Um, there's a whole heap of, heap of things it can work with. And then what it does is it talks to the, um, the horizontal pod autoscaler and then talks to virtual node and scales out that way. Um, so Keta allows you to do, to do a lot of cool things. Um, and it, run, it, it runs both in a standalone method or it runs also in um, another method which installs um, another product, another library by Microsoft, uh, by De Open Deus, or Deus Labs, sorry, I keep saying Open Deus, it's a, it's a habit, it's from Deus Labs, um, and it's called Osiris. And what Osiris does is allows um, a zero scale effect on a pod. Because on Kubernetes, if you scale a pod to zero and you have a service endpoint, once traffic goes there, like, it gets lost and there's a whole issue there. Um, Osiris is another event um, component that sits there and allows the service to have no pods beneath, beneath it. And then once it needs the pods, it Keta will scale, scale them up. Um, so this is what Keta looks like. If you see there, the external trigger store, scaling pods, you've got the Kubernetes etcd store there, you've got the controller and all the parts of Kubernetes, and the horizontal pod autoscaler, so you can see there it's looking after it. So Keta doesn't actually replace our horizontal pod autoscaler, it actually works with it. Um, so what we're going to do now is just run a demo, because um, it takes a minute. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to use Porter and we're going to install um, RabbitMQ via Helm, then we're going to do a deployment, and I'll go through the deployments, and we're going to install a publisher and a consumer, and we're going to scale it all on virtual node right now with a single command. So we just go porter, oh, if I can spell porter install minus C. Um, the minus C is passing the credentials file for where my kube control file is, so I can actually speak to Kubernetes. So as you can see there, it's installing the Keto Keta demo. Now I'm going to come back to this because it takes a minute for RabbitMQ to get up, um, start up. But as you can see now, it's already invoking Helm. So just with a single single command, I'm invoked Helm, and I'm going to do some Kubernetes deployments. So let's have a look at what those deployments are, and we'll come back and look at the horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, so as you can see with that, um, with that CNAB bundle, what we've done is we've installed uh, RabbitMQ. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a deployment. And it's just a, a, a sample deployment. And, but the, you'll notice down the bottom here, what we're going to do is we're going to say this deployment right here has a node toleration only to run on virtual kubelet. Um, so that's not going to run on a, normal, uh, on a normal node. It's only going to scale onto virtual kubelet. Now, you can see down the bottom there, the uh, virtual kubelet is ACI. If that was Amazon, it would be Fargate or, or, or such like that. Then what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to use a custom resource definition that Keta uses to, um, to have a scaled object. 
And this will look and see the pollen intervals and everything that needs to happen within the RabbitMQ stack. And then we're just going to run the batch job, which is the publish. Um, so we can, see, we can see things start to scale off. Uh, so as you can see there, that was a whole lot of stuff. I just deployed with a single command. So like CNAB is pretty awesome. So let's go back. So uh, RabbitMQ still hasn't started. So what I'll do is just go to my other terminals. So as you can see here, we've just got a, a, an Azure um, AKS cluster, but you'll see that there's an extra node there that looks a little bit different. So you can see there that I've got the virtual node running, and my cluster is running 114, which is the latest that we can run on Azure, uh, and the virtual and the virtual kubelet's running there. So the virtual kubelet's acting like a single node, but what it's actually doing is is talking to the ACI API, and what it's getting back, it's returning into like calls that Kubernetes knows natively that uh, a node has. So let's go back and hope that. So virtual kubelet. Um, so we've just deployed, um, as you can see there, RabbitMQ. Now we're deploying the consumer. So if we go over, oh, oh I killed that. Let's have a look. So that's going to get the horizontal product autoscaler. And if you have here, so what we can see here is you can see a whole heap of pods terminating. That's OK, because they're actually running serverless functions. Um, but you can see there on the node that it's actually only deploying on virtual kubelet. So none of, these, none of this scaling event that Patrick needed is actually happening on my AKS cluster. So performance of all the other applications I've got running there is actually nothing, because I'm offending all this load, this extra load that's just happened into virtual kubelet, which is awesome. And then if I go back to my scaling, you can see now that I'm starting to get uh, scaling events happen. So you can see I had a zero replica of, of the consumer, um, and that's because I had no traffic. And as we're starting to deploy pods, you can see the replicas, the replicas are going up depending on the traffic. So before I had HTTP scaled to zero, zero. Now I've got more traffic. I've got one. I've got four coming up now. So as you can see, with that single command through um, CNAB, I've deployed a whole infrastructure looking after a whole scaling event and scaling mechanism, which is, which is quite, quite complex. Um, so let's go back to the slides. Um, the good thing about this particular demo as well is I've open sourced it. Um, if you want the code and you want to run this yourself, there it is. All, it's all there. It's all in CNAP. All you need is a, an Azure account um, because it does need virtual node. Uh, if you know virtual kubelet enough and you can get virtual kubelet working on another cloud provider, um, it, just, take the C, uh, the, yeah, just take the CNAP um, bundles and you'll be able to deploy them there. Uh, and then there's all these other um, things that Patrick spoke about. That's where they come. Uh, that's all where you can get all the different things. And of course, down the bottom, if you want to work for Microsoft, especially in China, we're looking for cloud um, developer advocates to join mine and Patrick's team. So if you're looking for a new job, you love containers, and you're in China, come and see us after the talk. Uh, any questions? OK. OK. Uh, if there's no questions, we, we, we'll be around uh, outside uh, for questions after this talk. Uh, just a summary of what we presented here. The goal here is when you're developing an application that has uh, containers, functions, and cloud services, there are several extensions in VS Code and in Azure that let you develop that part of that multi-technology uh, multi application. CNAB uh, and the implementations of CNABs are is a specification uh, plus some implementation that lets you deploy these applications. And then KEDA is a pretty good way of uh, scaling that, uh, uh, these applications and it, uh, an open source project that runs into any Kubernetes uh, cluster. Yep, so CNAB, uh, CNAB, KEDA, and Virtual Kubelet are not Azure specific. Uh, vir uh, Virtual Kubelet's actually in CNCF, um, but yeah. You can run them all on Azure as well. And just for bonus, this was actually, those demos were run on WSL2, running a custom kernel. Um, so with VXLAN support and a whole heap of other stuff that I built on Friday night at an airport, so I'm glad it, it held up for my demos. <laughs> and that's all. But thank you very much for coming out to the talk. Thank you. Thank you.